found a small little problem on the on your formula sheet. So you're gonna have to pull this out and make this correction. In fact I need to correct it. Y'all got your formula sheet? So we're looking at formula number 14, the bottom one. This guy right here. And we can make this a little simpler, guys. I'll show you in a minute. So this is supposed to be half wave. And this is, a, this is, a, this is an approximation. And what this does is this leads out. This doesn't compensate for the, for the diode drop. Uh, but what it'll be is just a real fast way to uh, this is just a real fast way to to check your work and I'll show you how you came up with it uh, but instead of using uh, point 0.9 uh, let's get rid of uh, if I can edit it yeah so I'm going to get rid of the two and uh, use point 0.45 which is, and I'll show you how we come up with these. Uh, but this ignores the diode drop. It says no, the answer will be slightly larger than the actual value because VF of the diode is ignored. And VF is the forward voltage drop, that 7 tenths of a volt that we use for silicon and 3 tenths of a volt that we use for, uh, for germanium. So this is the formula for V peak secondary. It's VRMS over 0.707. And I learned a long time ago, you can take a division problem and convert it into a multiplication problem by taking the reciprocal. So the reciprocal of 1.707 uh, is 1.414. And that formula is somewhere up there. A lot of books teach that. I like VP over, I like 0 0.707 because that way that's a common number. You know that if you're going from, uh, going to VP, you divide by 0 0.707. If you're going by, to RMS, you, you uh, multiply by 0 0.707. Uh, but if you look, these are on there. Uh, then what you do is you say, this is the formula right here, V peak secondary divided by pi. So what I've done up here is I've said V peak RMS would be equal to, uh, so V peak secondary, V peak RMS times, uh, times 1.414, that would be V peak secondary divided by pi. Then what you do is split the equation out and take 1.414 and divide it by pi, and that comes up. So I can take the RMS, which means actually the RMS value of the of the, of the transformer, and multiply it by 0.45, uh, and that would give me the approximate DC output without going through all that garbage. And it'd be real easy to use on tests, right? You understand? Uh, to use this formula and try to use the V peak over pi because it's a lot faster. Y'all understand that? That makes sense. Yes or no? Brian's going. Uh, the 0.635 uh, that you learn in DC, I mean, I'm sorry, in AC is, is V peak over pi, 2 V peak over pi. Uh, so you see all these fractions. Uh, what I like to do is say, okay, where did these fractions, how did they actually come up with 0.45? How did they come up with 0.45? Right? How did they come up with 0.9? Yeah, I'll go. I'll drop those off because we didn't teach that. I I need to go back and look at that. So what it does when I drop it off, it'll it'll. 
Yeah, yeah, I'll go ahead. I'm, this one, this one, we don't need to know a lot of that stuff. All I did was try to explain why they called it a sine wave. And uh, that the in, instantaneous voltage is, uh, we did look at the formula, by the way, uh, is dp times the sine of the angle is what the actual answer is. Uh, but I don't know if that, if that, is that one on the formula sheet? Well, okay. So that's. Can you print it? I got an extra one up here somewhere. I just got to remember what I did with it because I ran off enough for the class. Hold up, Will. So the formula sheet is very important. But uh, if you get you a computer right now, you could just look at it on Blackboard. It's up on there. But, So I've added this to the PowerPoint, so I'll go up and upload it uh, later on. But I just wanted to show you where this 0.45 came from. But that's an approximation, right? You understand that? Uh, because what are we ignoring? We're not taking out for the diode drop. But what we're saying is going to be close enough so you can do what? You can check your answer, right? So we're talking about full wave rectifiers. So we call this a full wave because what we're doing is, so this is the signal we should get out of a half wave with an oscilloscope. And that's the advantage of oscilloscope because you can actually see what's there, right? So you can actually see if it's half wave or full wave. So if I was expecting a full wave, if I was expecting this and I saw this, what do you think that would tell you? Huh? Well, no, I, I'm, I'm looking at my circuit with an oscilloscope. I'm expecting this, but I see this. What do you think that, what do you think you know right off the bat? When you're expecting, when you're expecting to see, to see this, but you see this, what do you think it's telling you? Something's wrong because I'm expecting what? I'm expecting this, but I'm seeing a halfway. What do you think that tells you? Right off the bat. No, but we're trying to, I'm troubleshooting a circuit. And I'm suspecting, short, shorts blow fuses, right? It either burns stuff up or blow fuses. So this is a big thing that we have in electricity because most of the time when we have a problem out there in the real world, just about everybody calls it a short. I got a short. You are not, you are a technical person. You need to know the difference between a short. A short is an undesirable path for current flow. If I have a short in most circuits, something's gonna, gonna be bad. We're not gonna lose half of the waveform. We're gonna lose a bunch of stuff, right? You understand? Shorts cause fires. So if it's not a short, this set here is telling me right off the bat that one of my diodes is open. So I'm supposed to get this. And then I'm seeing this, then this tells me that one of my diodes is open, which no current flow is getting through it, right? So the diode that gives me one of my alternations. So, so y'all need to make sure you know the difference between a what? A short. Shorts cause fuses to blow. Shorts cause devices to burn up. Shorts cause big problems. Opens can cause a problem, but it's not going to cause a fire. Right, you understand. So what? Uh, uh, what is a short? A short is an undesirable path for current to flow, which means I've I've lost control of the current flow. If you have a short, the total current in the circuit will always, always, always go up. Total resistance goes down. If you have a short circuit, then it should it's going to burn stuff up or it's going to blow a fuse. Right, something's going to give up. So this is what we're going to see out of a uh, out of a full wave, and we were looking at a full wave center tap. Everybody okay with this? So this guy requires an additional diode. I can't get my pen out. Requires an additional diode, and also requires. 
a center tap transformer. So this is the diagram that they're trying to show you, okay, is that what happens. I think these are in your textbook. By the way, I did find my other textbook. It was cramped. No, it was in that thing right there. So when this is plus, this down here is going to be what? Minus. Everybody okay? So right off the bat, all we need to do is put a plus there, not minus there. This guy right here would be what? On or off. Plus on the anode. This guy would be what? On. This guy right here would be what? Off. This is considered zero volts at all times, right? You understand that? So what's current's going to flow out of this, it's going to flow what? Up through the resistor. It's looking for its positive. Why is it not going to go down? Because this guy's what? Off, you're right. This is going to do what? Go back up, go back to this node, back to its plus. So current flow through the resistor is in this direction right here. So since it's electron flow, that makes the bottom of the resistor negative, makes the top of the resistor positive. And so what we'll do is we'll end up with this pulse right here. And what happens right there, both nodes will be off, right? You all understand that? Because we've got zero volts. In fact, when we fall below around seven tenths of a volt, they turn off. Are we okay? Now, on this one, they swap polarities. So that puts a plus right here, puts a minus right there. This guy up here is going to turn what? Off. Yeah. This guy right here, this guy right here is going to turn what? On. So current is going to do what? It's going to rotate the same way, right? Back up here again. That's going to make this negative. That's going to make this positive. Why isn't it going to go up? Yeah, it's off. It acts like an open switch, right? And it's looking for its positive. It's not looking for the negative. It's looking for its positive. So it'll flow back through this diode and then back up to this side of the transformer. So what we'll do is we'll end up with this. And then, then we go back to this, then we go back to that, then we go back to this. So what we get out of this guy, it would be this right here. Everybody okay? Yes, no? The problem we have here is that when we look at this diode, um, this right here is positive, this right here is negative. So when we look at the, the breakover voltage for the diode, uh, which the book calls it PIV, but we looked at this, uh, most data sheets call this the reverse breakover voltage. Now half wave, half wave, uh, we, can, we can make sure it's going to block V peak. But on a full wave like this, then this guy has this guy here's got to be able to uh, to block V peak to peak. You all understand? Yes or no? Because on this one, if you just look at this one, this guy's seeing positive, this guy's seeing that, but over here this guy's seeing what? That. So this diode is going to have to be able to drop, going to be able to have to block this voltage right here. So what happens if you exceed the breakover voltage of a diode? Yeah, something's going to happen. The problem with semiconductors is they can go bad several different ways. They can become what we call leaky, which means they conduct all the time in the reverse direction and they don't work right. Uh, they could short, which is bad because if this guy right here shorts, then that's going to be a piece of wire. 
So that means this right here is going to be applied directly to that right there. That's bad, right? You understand? Or it can open. Uh, opens are per so uh, if it shorts, we have a short circuit. What's that? Oh yeah, but the problem is that we can't we 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 prefer things, but then we get what we get, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, a short uh, an open would not blow stuff up. Uh, what we would do is we would if if this diode right here opened, then we would just we would just lose that thing right there, and instead of half wave, we'll get full instead of full wave, we get half wave, and we'd get half of the voltage out that we intended. So this is one of the things you need to remember. If you know what voltage you're supposed to get out of the power supply and you're not getting near as much, this is one thing that we would consider as one of our diodes is what is bad on a full wave power supply. Now on a half wave power supply, if the diode shorts, what'll happen? Yeah, if the diode shorts in a half wave, what would happen? Well, what you're going to do, instead of putting DC across your load, you're going to put what across your load? AC. And that could cause problems. Especially if it's, especially if it's a device, it won't, a resistor don't care. Right? You understand. Instead of seeing DC, it'll see RMS and that whatever the RMS value would be. Uh, but what's going to happen if I measure this with my meter, I'm expecting DC, so I'll have my meter on DC. What's my meter going to measure? Yeah, it's going to measure zero. <laughs> you know. So another thing you need to consider, you need to flip your meter on AC, right? You understand, on, my, on a halfway record bar, because you could still get shocked. So your meter measures zero, and this right here is 120 volts, and your meter measures zero, when you say, okay, I'm going to pull that resistor out, and you don't pull, you don't turn power off, which is stupid anyway, right? Y'all know anytime you, you actually do repair, you're supposed to do it with power off, right? But any full wave rectifier, if, if, one, of your, if you, one of your diode shorts on a full wave rectifier, you end up with a short circuit. Short circuit, somebody's going to give up, right? So hopefully, if the fuse is sized, sized right, the fuse will blow. So if I measure with an ohm meter, uh, of course, when I measure, uh, I'm sorry, with if I check the fuse. By the way, another thing we have problems with is how much resistance does a transformer have? I'm listening. Yeah, is it going to be high or is it going to be real low? Huh? It's going to be real low because it's nothing but wire, right? So a transformer is nothing but wire. So what determines the resistance of a wire? Good. The size, yeah. And then the length. So that's all. When, when, if you don't have AC on this thing, when you got AC on this, this magic thing called... X of L comes into play, and when you take it, so it has an opposition, more opposition to AC than it does DC. But when you got power off there and you put your meter on ohms, by George, your meter is nothing but a, a, a DC source, right? You understand that? So if you ever measure the resistance of a transformer and it measures extremely high, then it means the transformer is bad, right? Y'all understand that? Uh, so. Uh, this gets us into problems when we try to come over here and try to measure inside a circuit that's got a transform in it, is that what's going to happen is we're going to try to go back through the transformer, right? You understand that? So what you need to do, guys, and rule of thumb, if, if a device measures good in circuit, then you assume it's good. If it measures bad in, the, in an electronic circuit, you isolate it, which means you, pull, you, get, you open up one lead. You don't have to open up two of them. You, have, you just open up one of them. Because what could happen is something something in parallel might be bad, right? You understand? 
uh, in transformers. So when you take motor controls, guys, uh, they're going to they're going to tell you to measure the resistance of the circuit, and what you need to do is you're going to have to disconnect the transformer because if you don't, you're going to be measuring 20 ohms all the time because you're measuring the resistance of the transformer, right? Uh, so transformers have really really low resistance. In fact, uh, that's one of the ways that we check the transform. And uh, by the way, some some things can happen too. Uh, we got windings that that can actually short out. So if a winding shorts out on a transformer, what's going to happen? Well, the output voltage of the transformer is going to be a lot less than what it's supposed to be, right? You understand? No eating in my class, though, huh? No eating in my class. It bought. <laughs> a winding inside the coil. So a coil is considered the whole thing, right? You understand? But what happens is if, but uh, I've, I've, I've shown y'all transformer wire before. It's called it's called magnetic wire because what we're trying to do is we're trying to get extremely close coupling between the wires. So this is transformer wire right here. Here you can. This is magnetic. They call this magnetic wire. And literally, you can burn that insulation off with a cigarette lighter. It's so thin because what we're trying to do is we're trying to get extremely close coupling between those wires. So what happens, and then we got we got AC on them. Well, what AC does is when the polarities are the, the so what's happening is the secondary and the primary are constantly pushing away from each other because the current in the secondary, if they're wound on top of each other, is always opposite from the current in the primary. So what's going to happen is they're going to pull into each other, and then when it goes to zero, what's going to happen? It's going to pull apart, and that's why tra most transformers hum. You're actually hearing the what? You're actually hearing the wires do that. You get that extremely thin wire, and you're and you got stuff in motion. Then what happens? Well, eventually, if you don't do something, the wires are going to what? They're going they're going the insulation is going to wear off. So a lot of your high current transformers will actually be dipped in a real hard lacquer. So they'll wind them, then they'll dip them down in the lacquer so it seals everything up and the windings can't move as much. Uh, but if the transformer gets, it's very common that a winding or multiple windings inside a transformer will short. And when that happens, what you've done is you've changed the turns ratio in the transformer. And what that means is the output voltage of the transformer will be wrong right you understand that so that's one consideration if the output is lower than it's what's supposed to be it should you might you might need to check the transformer and unfortunately they're real hard to do but you do know what the output voltage should be right so in a full wave rectifier a shorted diode is always a short circuit Thank you. On a half-wave rectifier, a shorted diode is not a short circuit, but what you're going to do there is you're going to put AC across your load, right? You understand? If the load's not designed for AC, then, like, if you put AC on your car radio out there, it'd probably burn it up, right? Because it's designed, all that electronic circuitry inside there is designed for what? It's designed for DC, yeah. So this is the formula that we, this one is right. Uh, so this is a quick way that we can check that, and this is solid for the whole thing, going all the way through the math. So you can take the RMS and multiply it by 0.9, and that would give you a pretty close to what your answer should be, all the way over on the, uh, all the, way over on the DC side, which is pretty neat. But it's not going to be exactly right, and why is that? Because you're ignoring the what, the diode drop. But this is a real way, real good way, especially on a test, to check your work. So if you do this and you come off, you know, 15 volts difference, then you know you did your, your original one right. And a lot of times, guys, on a test, you could use this, and, and, and it's multiple choice, and you'd be able to find the answer that way, too. So that's a lot faster, right? Uh, everybody understand turns ratio? Yes or no? So what determines the amount? So we're we're creating this through magnetic induction. 
And what determines the amount uh, that I induce into this guy right here, from this guy right there? The amount of voltage, what determines this? First of all, what do we need to have to induce a, uh, uh, we need, first of all, to induce a voltage, we need a magnetic field. We need a conductor. And the third thing we need is what we call relative motion. Uh, uh, and this would be between uh, the magnetic field and the conductor. What determines the amount, so let's just go down the line. So what would determine the amount, number one, would be the strength of the magnetic field. Number two would be the number of conductor loops in the coil. And number three would be the speed of the motion. So this is why we can't pass 8 DC through a transformer because DC does not provide relative motion, right? You understand? So what's got to happen is this magnetic field here has got to cut that right there. So what we're doing right here is we're playing around with this right here, the number of conductor loops. So if my primary has more turns than my secondary, then my output voltage would be less than the primary. If my primary has less than the secondary, then my secondary voltage will be more than the primary. So we can step up or step down. And it's directly proportional to the ratio of this. So right here it says for every one turn I have over here, I'll have two turns over there. So that means over here, just for real, let's say I have 100 turns over here, over here I'll have 200 turns. We have more turns on the secondary than we do have the primary. So this guy right here would step up by two, so times two. So that means if I had 25 volts peak to peak over here, then over here I would get what? I would get 50 volts peak to peak over here. So the turns ratio of the transformer determines if the first of all if it steps up or steps down, right? You understand. Uh, so if if it was a one to one, then it, we would call this an isolation transformer because the output on the voltage on secondary would be the same as voltage on primary. So ours is a step down. So ours we're getting 120 volts over here, and we're getting 12.6 over here uh, across the full across here. So what would be the turns ratio of this transformer? This is RMS. You can use RMS. You can use peak to peak. You can use peak uh, to calculate the turns ratio. This what? Yeah, so it's about 10 to 1. 10 over here, one over there, right? Does that make sense? So you can figure out the turns ratio, and this is the things that they consider when they're designing uh, a transformer. Of course, then you got to decide how much current. So what determines uh, the size of the conductor determines how much current you can get through the transformer, right? You understand that? So what we would find if we looked at this, uh, we would find that this has a smaller size. Oh, I'm sorry. This is a step up. So this, the wires over here would be smaller than the wires over here. And why is that? Yeah. Well, here we go. Here we go. Here we got low voltage going to high voltage because this is a step up transformer, right, Brian? Yeah, I'm sorry. Let's get rid of that. You're right. So I messed up. Rich does that every once in a while, right? I'm I'm looking at the last one. 
So you're right. This right here would be the small wire. I was I was looking at the two to one when we we changed the ratio ourselves. So this would be a small gauge wire, and this right here would be a larger gauge wire, right? Because what we what are we transferring through the transformer? Sort of. Yeah, we're transferring power. Powers work. And we assume power in and power out equals each other, right? So, so you can look at the transformer. Uh, I don't know if I've got, I think I got one over here. I think it. This uh, this transformer has a shield around it, so you can't really see the laminated core. So this is a center depth transformer. So the two red wires would be the primary, and the two uh, and then the, the yellow and blue, would, yellow and yellow would be the secondary. Of course, the, the yellow the two sides forward would be uh, the outside of the transformer, and the blue would be the center. Uh, uh, it wouldn't surprise me if the doorbell didn't use that transformer. Uh, older doorbells. That's all older, old, older doorbells were. They, all they were was just transformers. So this would be like the one you're using. That's a 12.6. That's a 120 to 12.6. Uh, so that's got a ratio of close to 10, right? That's the one that actually came out of the trainer. That one's bad. Uh, that is what we call a multi-tapped transformer. So it's got several secondaries on it. So they unfortunately they don't give the color codes here. So I, I can probably get them because we've had to replace them. So here's the actual power supplies on the trainer. So the power supply it's got one. So look, it's got this is what we call a multi winding transformer. So this is the primary. It's got it's got two center tap windings on it and then it's got one uncenter tap. So this is actually and that's why it's got so many wires on there. So I'd be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten wires that should be on that transformer. Uh and fortunately that when on this diagram they did not put the color wires, so right now it'd be hard for us to troubleshoot unless we unless we actually looked at one uh, so I need to do that. Uh, so uh, that would be the actual transformer that's in here. So uh, this is the one that we're going to be dealing with. This right here, uh, and they call it center tap 6.3, 6.3. So it's actually what we call a 12.6 volt center tap transformer is what it is. Uh, and this is the one that we'll be using during our uh, during our power supply labs. Uh, so here's the transformer, here's the rectifier, here's the filter, here's the regulator, here's the output. So that's a perfect example of that block diagram that we looked at before. These are the light emitting diodes that come on. Uh, I think it's uh, two reds and a green. So they're actually hooked on the output. So if these right here are not on, it don't mean it's, it's bad, uh, but if these are on, then odds are uh, then it's going to be a problem just in this circuit right here, right? Does that make sense? So these are uh, these are fixed regulators. These are variable regulators right here. 
So these are the two that's on, that's connected to your knobs where you can actually adjust the outputs, uh, which would be on like on these big uh, trainers over here, these big power supplies right here. I don't know if we got the schematics on this, but it would be pretty easy to figure out. So if I've got 120 volts over here, and I got a one to five ratio, uh, what would be my output voltage over here? DC. Oh. All right, get your calculator out. Work on that. We'll get somebody killed. Uh. So over five turns we have in our primary. Uh, so I've gave you the primary voltage. And what we're trying to do is figure out what DC that we need to expect over on the right hand side over there. So tell me where I need to start. Nobody knows what I need to start. Yes, no. Where do I need to start to fact uh, figure this thing out? Okay, so I come over here and say uh, VAC on the secondary uh, would be equal to 120 divided by 5, right? And what does that give me? 40. Sorry. I can't do math. So you need to watch out for me. Okay. So you you're one of you're you're one of those, right? So you you want to get out early every day, and then at the end of the semester you and I've heard no, I've heard this before. I've heard this I've heard this before. Uh, then the student comes back and says, "We didn't learn in that class. We didn't learn anything in that class. He let us go early every day." <laughs> so what am I doing now, guys? So that would give me what? Yeah, it would give me 12 and 12. Everybody understand why? Yes? Okay, so what do I need to do now? So good, so far, so, so, so far, so good. We're trying to find out our DC voltage that we're going to expect out here. So, Volts DC would be equal to V peak over pi. Did I put peak out there or did I put volts? Okay, so it's RMS. That's exactly right. That's a good point. So if it's on AC, if you don't specify peak, and if you don't specify peak to peak, then it's RMS. And so, in, in fact, all AC voltages are given in RMS. But when we calculate it, we got to know what? We got to know peak. I'm listening. I'm listening. So V peak secondary would be equal, V peak, is it going to be more than 12 or less than 12? More. So I know I got to divide by the fraction, right? So I'm going to say 12 and divide by 0 0.707. Or you can multiply by 1.414. That's in the formula sheet too.
because we're only using one half of the transform at a time. And that's that's what that a lot of people make that mistake on a center tap because when they give you transformers, it's not like on this trainer. They're not going to say 6.3, 0, 6.3. They're going to say it's a 12.6 volt center tap transformer. In fact, we can we can look at this one right here as an example. So if I look at this, it says 12.6 VCT. So it says 12.6 center tap. The problem is, is that we're not using the whole tw we're not using the whole 24 at any one time. We're splitting that up between one side of the transformer and the other side of the transformer, right? You understand? So when I come over here and, and uh, this is this is minus and this is plus, then this would be minus. This would be plus. This guy here's this guy here is on. This guy here is off. So I'm not even using that side of the transformer. In fact, I could I could strip this whole thing off and I would have a halfway rectifier. But it's but I'm only using I'm only using the 12 volts RMS. I'm not using the 24, right? What do you mean? I'm listening. Yeah, but this is a negative power supply. There's the cathode right there. Yeah. Yeah. It's not reversed. The diodes are. Reversed. This is a negative supply. So what we get, what we're going to get out is this, but it don't change the math, right? You understand? So I understand on a, on a center tap transformer, on a, on a full wave center tap, we're only using one half of the transformer at a time. The other half is not even working. Huh? And that's what most people make a mistake. They want to use the full output of a, of the transformer when we're only using half of it at a time. That makes sense. Uh, then I need to calculate what we call V peak out. What's the forming sheet for V peak out? Yeah. So that's going to be uh, 16.9 minus 0 0.7, because that's on the other side of the transformer, right? I mean, on the other side of the diode. Everybody understand that? Yeah. So over here, we have 16.9. When this thing's turned off, if this is silicon right here, it's going to drop 7 tenths of a volt. So that means on this side of the diode, if I measured this with a scope, it would measure 16.9. If I measure right here with the scope, it's going to measure 16.2. We call that V peak out, yeah. All silicon diodes drop around. We don't say. If I say, if you see on a question that says a silicon diode drops exactly seven tenths of a volt, what are you going to answer? You're going to answer false. That's an approximation, but it works really well for our calculations, right? You understand? It's not going to be exactly right. It's just like uh, if I come over here and uh, I have a bunch of resistors, let's say a bunch of 1K resistors. And this right here was 12 volts. Well, I'd calculate and I say this right here is going to drop four volts. What's the odds of it dropping exactly four volts? Slim to none, right? And we'd say, okay, this drops four volts, and this right here drops four volts. So that 1K is not an absolute value. That 1K is close, right? Within five, but it could be 5% higher, it could be 5% low. Uh, what we learn after a while, especially in solid state, is that these guys are approximations, but they're close enough, we can use it in our calculations, and we'll be close enough to tell if the answer is right or the answer is, answer is wrong.
So what we have to understand in electronics is that your your mass is perfect, but your components are not, right? You understand that? So like I said, what do you do in DC when, you, when, when you're when you in DC? What did you do for all your resistors? You measured your resistors, and then you were supposed to use the measured values in your calculations. After that, guys, we don't do that anymore. So when you get to AC, uh, uh, we, we don't measure the resistors because now we know, right, you know, we know that the math is perfect, but our components are not. And we know that our answers will not be exactly what we get with our math, but we'll, they'll be so close that it's really, really easy to know that you got the problem. So when we calculate this, you know, uh, using this math, you know, we, we, we might calculate 5.2 volts and we come up with 5.4. That's only 200 millivolts difference between your calculated and your measured, right? You understand? So we know they're good. But if I, if I calculate 5.2, and over here I measure three, then we, we know we got a watt. We know we got a problem. Which it could be what? It should be an open diode on a full wave rectifier, or it could be a shorted winding in our transformer. Uh, so. so when we troubleshoot the five volt supply on this one, we're gonna be able to zoom in on that guy. In fact, I already know what's wrong with it. But we should be able to do this, right? Say, okay, this is what we expect and measure and see what we got. So uh so the 5 volt supply is bad on this train right now. And for some reason, we blow that one all the time. So it's regulated, so what should I expect to measure? Well, I should expect to measure 5 volts, but when I measure this, it's only measuring 1.2. So then we come over here, then we'd say what? Dope's DC would be equal to, what's that? No, that's the peak. Six point two divided by three point one four times two, because it's a full wave record of our two V peak over pi. So you could take thirty you could take sixteen point two and divide multiply it by two first, uh, and then divide by three point one four, or you could put it out to the side, whichever one you want. Okay, yeah, so we should measure ten point three volts, and this is DC, right? So anything that runs off any device or resistors would be fine. Uh what 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 kind of work do we get out of resistors? So what type of work do we get out of resistors? We only get one type of work out of resistors and that's what heat, yeah. You know. So these guys don't care if it's pulsating DC, they don't care if it's regular DC, they don't care if it's regulated DC, because all they're going to do is give us work, heat, right? You understand? But what we're going to find in electronics, we use these guys to establish a bias. And what's bias? We've already talked about that term. That's a very important t term to know. If I can spell bias. So what is bias? In electronics, not that you're biased against somebody, right? So this is going to be on next week's test. This is a very, very important. This guy right here is very important. to establish where it, where it operates at, right? And I don't know exactly what, it, it determines its operating character, so a diode. When a diode is forward biased, it acts like a closed switch. 
when a diode is reverse bias, it acts like an open switch, right? You understand that? So right off the bat, that's our first use of bias. Huh? I'm trying to I'm trying to determine or set or establish. To determine, to establish, to set. So DC bias is, is what actually sets how the semiconductor actually works. So in P and junction, we got two types of bias. We have forward bias and we have reverse bias. When it's forward bias, it acts like a closed switch. When it's reverse bias, it acts like an open switch, right? You understand? So we're going to be using that term a lot this semester. Anytime, so we're going to get into bipolar transistors. We're going to look at FETs. We're going to try to look at triacs and diacs. Every one of these things are biased with a DC voltage. Any questions? Yes, no. Yeah, I think I moved it, right? Because we got a worksheet we're going to do. Okay, full wave center tap. Everybody understand that? So that's what we call this. We it's a full. It's got its name. It's full wave center tap um, power supply. And the biggest problem we have here is people want to use the whole secondary voltage and try to, instead of trying to use one half. You don't understand that? You don't understand why we only use one half? So when this guy, so right now, uh, this is plus, this is minus. This right here is what? This is guy's off. This guy here would be on. My current flow, there's absolutely no current flow in that guy right there. My current flow is out here. There's no current flow out of that transformer over here through a wire back up over here. It's looking for its positive, so it goes right there. So what side of the transformer did we use? The only thing we used was that side of the transformer. We just use one half of the transformer. So that means if all the way across this is 12.6, and it's going to be VCT, which tells us the transformer, then all I'm using right now is what? Half of that, 6.3. Now, during the next alternation, everything swaps around, right? This transistor here would turn off. This transistor here would turn on. We would leave this, but now we're going to come back this way. So the second time, we're only using the bottom of the transformer. The first time, we're only using the top of the transformer, right? You understand? So we're only using one half of the transformer at any one time. And what's nice here is that you can get twice the current than what the transformer is rated at. So I can get one amp at the top and one amp out of the bottom, right? You understand? And the other one's got to... Uh, uh, so I'm sorry, we could get two amps out of the top, even though it's rated at one, because it's going to be off one half cycle, right? You understand that? So it's going to average out to one amp, so, uh, which is pretty neat. So does that make the 6.3 make sense now? You're okay? Because we're only using what? One half. But I can tell you, somebody in this class is going to use the 12.6. And, uh, and that's, and that's and I showed y'all the transfer. I pass it around again. It says 12.6. Then it's got VCT, which tells us the what is the center tap transformer. In fact, uh, that you can see the fuse on that. This was originally before we got these trainers with the with the transformer in there. Uh, that was the transformers right there that we used in this class. So the next full wave we have is what we call a full wave bridge rectifier. Uses how many diodes? Four. During the positive half cycle, two diodes are forward bias and two valves are reverse bias, and during the negative, they swap they swap positions. 
So normally what we do, guys, is they draw this thing as this bridge. So this is uh, this 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 uh, came uh, by from a. Uh, from this circuit right here. Did y'all look at the Wheatstone Bridge in DC? Huh? Oh, y'all should have. I need to make sure y'all do that. Uh, this was named uh, by a guy named Wheatstone. And uh, this, is, this was a really, really neat circuit. And this became known as the Wheatstone Bridge. So now, no matter what we connect in this configuration right here, they call it a bridge. So we call this a full wave bridge, four diodes. Now the advantage, one of the big advantages of this is it does not require a center tap transformer. So notice this is not a center tap transformer. Everybody okay? Now, and center tap transformers cost a lot more money than diodes do because they've got to go in there. It's got to add more conductors. they got to figure out where exactly the center is, right? You understand? You put that extra wire on there and then bring it out somehow. So that's the biggest advantage to this guy. So what happens uh, is when this is plus, this is minus. I follow this minus off. That means this guy right here would be off, right? You understand? I put a minus right there. This guy right here would be on. That makes sense. I follow this plus over here. Uh, that would turn this guy right here off because that's the cathode. That would turn this guy right here on. Okay. So current would leave this side of the transformer. Which way is it going to go? Well, it can't go this way because this guy's open. This guy right here is what? Closed. So what's it going to do? Something's going on. Wait a second. Well, what you, and this is, what, what y'all trying to see is y'all trying, this symbol right here is a wire. What we're doing is just cleans this up. So let me, let me get rid of the symbol. So notice there's no ground on this side, by the way. So let me get rid of the symbol and actually replace it with a wire as soon as I get the right color. I'm going to replace this symbol with a wire because that's what it is. It's a symbol that represents a wire. Right? You understand? So here we've got, we've got current sitting right here. Which way is it going to go? Is it going to go toward the off or is it going to go toward the on? Okay, so let me come back here and, and erase all this and start off. Okay, so what we're doing, notice here we've got this plus and we got this minus. So we're going to do exactly the same thing. So I'm going to come up here and I'm going to put a plus right there and I'm going to put a plus right there. Down here, I'm going to follow this around. I'm going to put a minus right there. I'm going to put a plus right there. No, I'm sorry. Duh. Let's go duh. All we're doing is following this sign right here. Okay. So I'm following that sign right there. So minus, minus, plus, plus. Okay, so here I've got a minus on my cathode. So this guy right here is going to do what? It's going to turn on, minus on the cathode. Here i got a minus on the anode. This guy right here is going to turn off. Now up here I have a positive on the cathode. This guy right here is going to turn off. Here I have a, I'm sorry, I got a positive on the cathode. It's going to turn off. Here I have a positive on the anode. This guy right here is going to turn on. Okay? Okay. Now what we're going to do is you got to understand this right here is a wire. It's a symbol that represents a wire. Okay. So you all need to draw the wire. Can we? Okay. So here comes current. What's, it, what's the minus looking for? Well, first of all, it's looking for its positive. So it's going to come over here. Which way is it going to go? Well, it can't go that way because this guy's what? Off. It's going to come up here, flow through this diode. Come up here. This is a piece of wire. It's going to flow over here, back up through here, right? You understand? Come through the resistor. It's going to make this positive, this negative. And which way is it going to go? Well, it's not going to go this way because this guy's what? Off. So which way is it going to go? It's going to get this way and return back to the positive side of the transformer. 
So what we get out is we get out this. That make sense? Now on the negative alternation, which means my transformer changes polarities, uh, then what we do is now this is negative, so let's follow this negative over. So that's going to put a negative right there, so we know this guy right here is going to turn on. That's going to put a negative on the anode, so we know this guy right here is going to turn off. I'm going to follow this positive over here now. That's going to be to put a positive there. This guy right here is going to turn off. Uh, that's going to put a positive right there. This guy is going to turn on. Now current leaves the negative side. Current flows from negative to positive, right? It's going to leave the negative side of the transformer. It's going to come over here. Which way is it going to go? It's going to go through the one that's what? On. And it's going to go through this wire right here, which is represented by a symbol. It's going to come back. The bottom's still negative. The top's still positive. It's going to come up here now. Can't go up. First of all, this is, right, it's looking for its positive, but it's going to go back to the one that's turned on and go back to the other side of the transformer. So we'll get this. The next alternation would go back to that and we'd get this. The next one would go back to this one, we'd get that. So we get full wave. That looks a lot prettier in mine. Yeah, so we give out a worksheet. That's why we move the test. So we're going to, we're going to get, I'm going to give out a worksheet, going to give you some of these circuits. You're going to calculate the DC output on all of them, right? Uh, by the way, you got to understand this is a cycle on my input. This is a cycle on my output. So full wave, your output frequency, uh, pulsating frequency is always going to be twice of what your input frequency is. On a full wave, your output, the pulse, so a cycle is a repetition. Okay, so I come over here and do this. Then a cycle would go from here to here. What we're doing on my DC is we're getting this. So this would be one cycle. This would be the second repetition. So that means if I've got 60 hertz over here, this guy here is going to be pulsing at 120 hertz. Yeah, well, because we have two cycles on the bottom, because a cycle is a rep, is one repetition, right? You understand? So on a full wave, your output frequency would always be one half of your input frequency. I mean, I'm sorry, twice your input frequency. On your half wave, that's that right? A half wave is going to be the same. A full wave is going to be twice of whatever your input frequency is. And we'll look at seeing what, what advantage of a real high frequency is. Uh, we can't do anything about our frequency because when they set up the power grid, how fast they had to turn the alternators and all that kind of stuff, uh, we, we are set here at uh, 60 hertz, right? Here in the United States. If it was over in Europe, it would be what? Anybody know what the frequency of Europe is? No. Frequency. So Europe uses 50 cycles. Over here, we use 60. And then you get into countries like Africa, they're split up, and then, like, uh, uh, for some reason. Uh, so, this once they've got this established, then we can't do anything about the power grid anymore, even though a higher frequency would be more efficient because the higher the frequency, the transformers become more efficient, which means the transformers could actually be smaller to give us the same power out. But we can't do anything about that now. We can do something about it with these guys right here. Because this is what we call switch mode power supplies. Uh, but these linear power supplies, we're stuck with what over here? Yeah, 60 hertz. So I'll bring a switch mode power supply over here and let you look at a, a transformer on the thing. And it's a little old tiny thing. But, uh, and we'll, we'll introduce you to that. But what you got to understand is a switch mode power supply is basically unrepairable because there's just so many things that come up. It's one of those things you start troubleshooting and everything is wrong, but everything is right. Does that make sense? <laughs> it's real weird. 
Uh, so it, th those things, so normally a switch mode power supply, when it goes out, we just replace it. Uh, these guys right here, these guys are fairly easy to fix. When these guys go out, uh, I think I told you about the instructor that wrote bad in permanent mark. Yeah, got mad about that. Because we can fix this, and we'll fix this. We'll fix this one right here. By the way, we are looking for work studies. Uh, we, I think, we're looking for two work study students. Uh, this is a good class to get into that. And one of the things you'll be doing, well, what we, one of the things we want y'all to do right off the bat is check every trainer in, that we have and make sure it's working. And if it's not working, we'll pull that up. We'll pull that out, and we'll let you troubleshoot. You know, actually fix them. But, and we'll help you with that, uh, by the way, to get started. But after a while, you'll say, hey, man, there's nothing to this. And you'll be fixing these things left and right. So, so we're looking for two guys that think it pays minimum wage. But it's a good it's a good opportunity if you, you know, if you're already working because right off the bat, you know, that gives you work experience that you could put on a resume. So, so we're only looking for two. So, uh, Two diodes in a bridge are always forward biased and in series with a load during the positive and negative half cycle. The problem with now, instead of subtracting, instead of subtracting 0.7, uh, we're going to have to subtract 1.4. You understand why? Because we're going through two diodes, right? You understand that? If we ignore the bare potential of the two diodes, the peak and output voltage is equal to, but we can't do that. I do that all the time too, by the way. <laughs> That's the still flat same formula. But remember it, uh, it's, it's not V peak, it's, it's what we call V peak out. So we, we got two things we're going to use. We're going to be V peak secondary, and then we're going to have what we call V peak out. A V peak out is what sets the DC. So over here on on uh, on on full way center taps, uh, we're, we if it's silicone. By the way, I've never seen a I've never seen a uh, I've never seen a germanium used in a power supply. I've seen it used in electronic circuits, but I've never seen it used in a power supply. Uh, the problem we what what advantage does silicon ha has over germanium? It's it's more stable with heat. Uh, germanium. Uh, uh, its barrier potential has, I mean, its uh, reverse, its leakage current varies more more with heat than silicone. Uh, of course, the biggest advantage of uh, of the germanium is that uh, it only drops up three tenths of a volt. But what we get with these is any time we put current through seven, any time we put current through through a voltage, even when it's forward bias, it's going to create heat, right? Because the power is equal to uh, V times I. Well, if I'm if I've got a 600, if I've got a diode, and that's why you see these these big high current diodes, they're going to be real big, right? You understand? And and they're going to be put on a heat sink. Y'all know what a heat sink is, yes or no? Yeah. What determines what determines and and, and the math is almost just like Ohm's law. Uh, what determines how much heat a device can get uh, can can get rid of is determined by its surface area. It's the, the material, of course, metals metals get rid of heat really well. So this is why a lot of your devices are made of metal, uh, especially your big diodes. And then, of course, how much surface area? Well, on these high current devices, we don't want to make them this big, so we make them fairly small, and then we mount them on a big chunk of metal that we call a heat sink. And what that heat sink does is it cr increases the watt. It increases the surface area to get rid of the heat. Huh? Point 0.7. Point 0.7. Current is flowing through this one. It's going to lose point 0.7 right there. Current is flowing through this one. It's going to lose point 0.7 right there. So that's why for when we set our output, we're going to use 1.4. It's a good question. So on, on a full way center tap, all we go through is one dive. Yeah. 
So notice we're going through two what? We're going through two diode drops. And if we use 0 0.7 that t for each one of them, that's why we use 1.4 here. Like I said, good question, right? When we're using a full wave bridge rectifier, a full wave center tap, we only go through one, one at a time. A full wave bridge, we go through two. And four diodes is a lot cheaper than a center tap transformer. So the advantage of full wave, of course, is that it's cheaper than, I mean, full wave bridge is going to be cheaper overall than a full wave center tap. Diodes are not very expensive. No, we're going to be using one in 4001s, and we can look up the price that we pay for those. So, we okay? I'm listening. Yeah. So that that would that would be seven tenths. Here we go through what uh, two every time. So here we use one point uh, one point four. What this one? This is one we've already V peak out is equal. Uh, so V peak out is equal actually equal to V peak secondary minus point so here it's going to be v v peak secondary minus one point four right now because this says if we ignore the barrier potential I don't even know why this slide is in here so v peak out is is equal to this but what we understand is that when I check my answer if we ignore this thing, we're still going to be close enough, right? You understand what I'm saying? Yes or no? So we've already talked about this one. Diode D1 and D2 are forward bias. D3 and D4 are reverse bias, right? Huh? The PIV rating uh, of the diode is half uh, that required for a center tap transformer. Yeah, they've got numbers here, yeah. On your circuit, what we're doing, this is for the Of course, this depends on what you what you what you buy. If you if you buy uh, if if you buy a, a nice circuit board that's got diodes on it, uh, this is the designator they use for diodes. By the way, they they use T, uh, they use D for di diodes. They use T for what? What do you think T's for? Transformers. Good. Uh, then we have we're gonna have uh, U, C for capacitors, L for inductors. Uh, integrated circuits. Guess what we go to integrated circuits? Very seldom. You'll see that every once in a while. What we're trying to do is come up with one designator for for everything. Uh, so normally integrated circuits are designated as U. Okay. Uh, then we have uh, transistors. We can't use T anymore, so they use another letter of the alphabet, so transistors are going to be Q. Uh, in this circuit right here, I, I'd have to look at the lab book and see if they're designated. If they're not, guys, you can number them yourself. Be consistent, right? So if you if you're consistent with this, if we come up here and race all this, uh, you notice that they're they're numbering the diodes according to according to the pairs. Okay. So notice. These guys are used in con conjunction with each other. These guys are used in conjunction with each other. These guys are used in conjunction with each other. So they're both on at the same time. 
and these guys here are both off or vice versa. These guys here are on and this guy, these guys here are off. So this is a pretty standard way of method. You number them with the ones that are on and off at the same time. So they could have, I mean, we could have just as well uh, call this D1, but if we call that D1, we call this what, D2, and then we call this D3, and we call this D, uh, D4. Or you could call this D1 and D2, right? Just as, and that's the way they number it according to the pairs that's on. And then when you do that, no matter how you do that, that statement that uh, over there would would be, be be correct, no matter how you, as long as you number in pairs. Does that make sense, Brian? Yeah. So like I said, I could have called this what? I could call this D1. I could call this what? D2. And then I could call this uh, D3. And D4, I could even swap them. It would still, it would still make that statement right. So that's a good question too. Okay, that means that that makes that statement on this other slide make sense, right? Yeah. So all they're doing is they're they're numbered in pairs. Uh, by the way, uh, there's a there's a let me show you the other way that these things are drawn, so just to not get y'all confused. If you're not already confused, right? Uh, you'll see these things. So this guy right here is hard to draw. So normally I'll come up here and do this, and then I'll come in and I'll fill the diodes in. Uh, and this will be AC. Now, the way you draw these things is that your AC is always going to have to see a cathode anode pair. Okay. And then over here, what you do is you just, you just match them. So uh, I'll come up here and match this anode right here, and I'll come over here and match this cathode right there. So notice down here I have an anode cathode pair. And then this would be the bridge. Now, what you got to understand, uh, this right here, since this is the cathode, this will be the minus, since this is the anode pointing back toward the source. So here we have the anodes pointing back toward the source. This is my source. So if the anodes point back to the source, this will be positive. Here the cathodes are pointing back toward the source, so this will be negative. You all understand that? So what number one they can do is they can take this and they can integrate this into a single package. And the ones I'll show y'all, they're four leads. Uh, the two center leads are labeled AC. And then this guy over here might be plus, and this guy over here might be minus. And this would be uh, the, the bridge in an integrated circuit. Now this minus, plus, and these two right here are just going to be what? AC. Both of them's AC. Uh, this is the way that I prefer to draw it because it's just so much easier. And you'll see them drawn like this sometimes, so you need to you need to need to know that. Is we'll just come over here and do this, and then I'll come over and do this, and then I'll come over here and draw my diodes right here. And this is nice because you just draw them in the same direction. And then your AC will come in right here. Now normally we won't do this, so I'm gonna do that just for show. And your AC would come in right here. Now notice this is the exact same circuit as that right there. So my AC sees a what? It sees an anode in the cathode. It sees an anode in cathode. Here my anode, so this right here, my anodes on this one up here, my anodes are pointing toward the AC source, so this will be positive. Over here, my cathodes are pointing toward the AC source, so this right here would be uh, negative. So you'll see that's a lot easier to draw that way, right? Yeah, here the cathodes are pointing back toward the AC source, so this would be negative. Over here, the anodes are pointing back toward the AC source. You'll see what I'm talking about? Here's the AC, yeah, the AC source is in the middle. I should have spread this out a little bit. And that's the problem. The problem on power supplies, people want to look at this, 
right here. They say, well, the cathode's on the top. That's negative, but it has nothing to do with the output. It has to do where the AC comes from, right? You understand that? So here's the AC, okay, and it's doing this. Okay, so when it's positive, this guy right here is going to be turned on. So that, that, that pulse is going to go out here. And this is a big problem that we have because people want to look at that and say, okay, that's negative, but we're not, we're not on the load. We're on what the source is letting through. So notice right here, these two diodes right here are looking at anodes. These two diodes right here on this side are looking at cathodes, right? So the sign is going to be opposite of the, what, what you actually look at on the diode symbol. And that gets people confused too. Uh, but this is another way that you can draw it. And what's nice about a, a bridge is you don't have to reverse diodes, guys. All you got to do, if you want a negative power supply, you'd, you'd use this as your common. If you want a positive power supply, you'd use that as your common. So on a, on a full wave bridge, you don't have to change diodes for a negative power supply or positive power supply. You just switch the leads coming out. Does that make sense? Yeah. So uh, if I on a full wave bridge, if I wanted to reverse them, I'd have to literally go in there and reverse my diodes. On a halfway bridge, if I wanted a negative power supply, I'd have to reverse my diode. A full way bridge, you don't have to do that. You just use this. So if I wanted a positive power supply, I would come over here and send this out, and then I would use this as my common. If I wanted a negative power supply, I'd just swap them. So that's another big advantage of a bridge is that you don't have to swap diodes. So now, they, now since you don't have to swap diodes, then they can integrate these things in a circuit, right? You understand, which is pretty neat. So if I put 120 volts over here, let's use the same ratio, 120 volts. And we've got a 5 to 1. So that would give us what here? 24 volts, RMS, right? Here we're not using the center tap. So that means we're going to use the entire 24 volts. So what would my DC output be? What should we expect?
back in there. So what would that be, guys? So what would be pink out be? Thirty-two forty-five volts peak. So what would my DC be? Seven. Are we okay? What's that? Yeah, so on the form, if you look at our uh, form sheet for uh, votes, so we're looking at for DC votes low phase, right? So what we're doing, if you look at all the form cards, we're dealing with what we call the slip rate and then what we call the formula for our slip rate. So this is the formula for all our watts. What? I, I forgot. I'm listening. I thought you said 22 was the number. No, it's wrong. 32 is the number, right? 32 is the number. 32. I can take the 24 volts and I can multiply it by 0.9, and this will give me the phase here from over here. So all we're trying to do is get a real quick way of checking to see if this answer is false. What this guy, what this formula does right here, is it goes like this. So what it's looking for is for the both the DC and the process. I'm expecting this to be slightly greater than that, so I know that answer is, pro is, is probably right. Let's see. Is this one? Huh? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. This one. So this formula right here is nice because we can check our work real, real fast because I don't have to be the first. I can take I can take the RMS vote from the first segment to the secondary. I can multiply by by ninety percent. So what we've done. So this is an extremely fast way to check to see if the answer you got is right, but but it's always going to be less because what I mean it's always going to be more because we ignore what you can vote here.
too. Right. So, so what would happen is that would all be that would all be buried. All I'm saying is you you nine is bare fine ground. And sometimes you can use the point nine because of the especially if the bullet sticks are all over the place in the head, right? So you got five point six, nine point five, you got ten point seven. Uh and you do that and you say, Well, I'm gonna put it here twelve oh point six and check there's some different ones that look like they have different answer. That could be right, right? So I'm saying this So we use the actual true formula. So we calculate VP gout. So VP gout is the chemical performance score. So VP gout is equal to VP secondary minus VP out. Which equals the VP secondary. And what do we get for VP secondary? 33.2 minus 2 PM minus 1. these formulas over here. We're dealing with single wave fruit flies. So what that means is so I can average the average total wave to be the Now notice this says any uh, on the standard curve you just want to correct it. It is always going to be higher than this one because both of these are like I said my hands are totally right or it's so when we calculate what it actually is, we came up with what we came up with. So here it came up with PM1, and so we can say, okay, that's equal to PM1. Well, what I'm saying sometimes on the test, you know, you can see by using the PM1, you could use that one. Since I have, since it has point one over two and two over one, I can come up with two. I can try to get the real one and come up with both of those. Because that's a mistake. That's a common mistake. That's a common mistake that people make, right? Center tail. We we use half. We use half of the secondary moles, right? You were saying, and there it is, right there. So look at your formula sheet. So it says full wave center, full wave center tail, V peak secondary divided by two, full wave full grade. So for full wave center tap, we use half the secondary moles. For full wave bridge, we use full. So this formula sheet can can equal either one of these two. Either one. We don't want to use either one because we don't want to find this one. We want to find the absolute one. Okay. Let's read it here. What I got to do?
Okay, guys. So what we
measure of dollars and cents that you can use to get to the next level. So in this case, you can see that I have a making a positive power supply. So I have this up here that's positive. So what I can do is I can put my hand up and draw this up here and push this up here. And then I'm going to come over here and just draw this up. See how much easier this is when I try to try to draw it up and show you how much time it shows. So that means up here I should have five more people making their hand up. Down here I should have only one more person making their hand up. So it means right here I'm going to have to use that button to grab the other hand up. And put it up here. And this right here is going to be my hand up. So the connection between this hand up here and the other hand up here is not going to be like it was when I was drawing it. It's going to be two hands up here and one hand up here. Okay? So when I hook this up, Now we can call this common. So here's my AC going on over here. I've got these cathodes that are connected to it. They're connected together in the same vertical line. So sit down. Then these cathodes are connected to the same vertical line. This is my wire that's representing my common right here. So I've got to run that wire. Now here's my AC coming in. These two diodes are in a different vertical line. 
go by eight and a half. So we can start to see the shorter ones. Now this is the center. You don't want these connected together. But see, these two are going to go together like this here. And then I bring my AC, and just like the drawing, I put this little thing that's right there. And I put my little screw in here. And here's my screw. Make sense? This is the light. And this is one chamber. And you can actually see the current in this one. Amen. Well, why would you do to calculate the current? Well, you just DC out, you divide it by 120. And you get the current. Well, our calculator is going to be 10 volts. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the current that we have in this one. And then you can calculate the power. Well, it don't make any difference which way you hook up the transformer because it's the same thing coming in. So, do y'all understand this code? back toward the source, right to this one, right? You see what I'm talking about? This one. Yeah, so the and is this one. This one, y'all can see the little stripe right there, see that's the cathode, right? And then this side right here is the resistor, right? There you go. See it? So the way this is We don't want, I want this one connected to this one, right? I'm saying. And then I want this one connected to that one. And then these connect them together. So what's going to happen is these are going to have to be in the middle, right? I'm saying. Have to be separate. Thank you. 
Determines how much current flows through a line. You're low. You're low. When you get that's when you get shot, you are low. Right? You are low. That's exactly what you are. You are low. What determines how much current flows between two your body? I is equal to span over all. So it's how much voltage. And how much resistance you have if you get in contact with that wire. 
So if you get if you get it across your ear, you're in trouble. But if you get across this, you got you got some problems. You can take all you can smash your body with this thing. It's strong. So on plow, you're on plow, right? And if you get across the surface, you get across the surface, you are you are done. Yeah. What that what turn it up? This is why you caught there, so you've got all this car back over here, and all you gotta do is just snap this up and you're good to go. And now go to Cuba. Well no, because it's only at twelve months. How much is your current system? You're not gonna get a hundred ounces through your body. You know the source has to have a label. You're not gonna get that current one. So how many of y'all test about the problem with the car back? A, a, a little, a little uh, uh, nine volt battery really hasn't have, has no current in it. It's cheating if it was at a hundred volts, right? It's going to have nine volts. What determines how much current level you get through your body? Both. Five. Nine point seven nine. 